So now we're moving into chapter six. Chapter six is about this problem of match moving. Okay. So match moving kind of broadly means, you know, how do I um, take a computer generated element, for example, and insert it into real footage so that it appears to live in the scene, right? And there are a bunch of, you know, complicated things that that really sell the illusion that the object is in the scene. You know, one of them, for example, is lighting, right? You have to make sure that the lighting of the inserted object matches the lighting in the physical scene. We're not going to really talk about anything like that. For our concern, the most important thing is geometry, right? So, for example, you know, when you put that creature in to, like, it's, there are lots of, lots of uh, things like G-Force and the Smurfs and stuff like that, little, little animated characters that are playing around on tables and chairs and stuff, right? You need to make sure that those creatures look like they are firmly planted on the surface that they're running around on, right? If their feet penetrate the table or if they appear to be floating above it or not perpendicular to the, to the ground plane, you know, then things look really weird, right? Uh, and also, there has to be the right scale, the right rotation and translation to make sure that, you know, you can place this new object into the 3D scene. So how, what do we need to make that work? Well, we need a couple things. One is that we need to kind of know three-dimensionally where are all the points in the scene so that we can put the object back in the right place. And if the camera is moving, then we need to know basically how to reproject that 3D character from any particular camera perspective. And so this problem of match moving, you know, if I were to state it concisely, it would be estimating uh, camera trajectory in 3D uh, plus uh, 3D positions of feature points. based on apparent motion of 2D correspondences. All right, so this, is, this is one reason that we cared so much about the features in chapter four, is that, you know, what is our basis for figuring out how the camera moves around? Well, the only thing that we can do is observe the images that we have obtained, right? And what can we pull out of those images? Well, we can pull out feature points, right? And using the detection and matching algorithms that we talked about in chapter four, we can <coughs> not only match feature points image to image, but we can also hopefully build long tracks of feature points as they move as the camera moves around, right? And so typically what you have in a match moving scenario is, you know, a bunch of images. You have the position of the feature point in each of these images. And if I were to trace out this trajectory, I would kind of have a little path of that feature point that moves around. I see the paths of a whole bunch of those feature points, and I use those to estimate the camera trajectory. Right? Now, this uh, problem, you know, it's called match moving in the visual effects industry, okay, or camera tracking. So there are a bunch of names, you know, that you may see that are related to this idea. Camera tracking is one. In computer vision, the key problem is called structure for motion. sometimes abbreviated SFM. Um, so there was a lot of, you know, this is actually one place where professors and grad students made a visible impact on the visual effects industry. Some of the stuff we talked about in the early parts of the class are really still more on the academic side, but this is a place where basically, uh, you know, I think a lot of work came out of the University of Oxford Computer Vision Group, where they really worked hard to solve the structure for motion problem, and then they commercialized it into a package called Buju that was then picked up by the visual effects community and used to do all these effects, right? So for example, I remember seeing a talk by one of the Oxford professors saying that, you know, he had just seen a preview for the new Harry Potter movie, and he knew that the Harry Potter match move data was still sitting on his hard drive at the office waiting to be fully processed, right? So there was definitely this connection between uh, the film industry and the academic industry, or the academic world, uh, purely in the context of this problem. Buju, Buju, B O U J O U, right. So what I just said was this Buju has a connection with Oxford, and the company that produced Buju was called Two D Three, and I think Two D Three got bought out by somebody. I need to check on that. Um, anyway. So as we'll talk about a little bit later, and as you'll find out in the homework, there are a bunch of both commercial and kind of freeware structure for motion packages that you can use to solve this match moving problem. That's why I want you to investigate a little bit on the homework. Um, 
Another closely related field is called photogrammetry, which is a weird sounding word. But basically, you know, the idea of looking at images and understanding what the three dimensional objects uh, that correspond to the images are, that came up very early in like almost the 1940s and 1950s when they were flying planes over terrain, taking pictures and wanting to know how they could build terrain maps from these aerial images, right? And so lots of the underlying techniques that we're going to talk about here uh, were discovered by these kind of uh, US Army and Air Force you know, researchers back in the day who really understand the mechanics of how images are projected from 3D world onto a 2D image plane. And then some of the stuff that was kind of talked about in the 1980s and 90s from computer vision was actually rediscovering some stuff that people had known in a different field entirely for many, many years, right? So it's a question of you know just that that idea not percolating directly to the academic community where it started in the military world. Uh, another one that you may have heard of that is a little bit related, although we're not going to talk about it really much here, is called SLAM. That stands for simultaneous location and mapping, and that's something that is really more of a robotics idea, right? So you may have uh, you know you've probably seen these DARPA Grand Challenge kinds of things where you've got a robot could be like an autonomous car, it could be just a little buggy that's driving around in a hallway somewhere. That robot is uh, sensing the world. Often robots are not necessarily using images, they may be using other sensors like ultrasound or LIDAR, but many of them do have cameras. And from these observations, the robot is trying to self-localize itself with respect to its 3D environment, which is really the same kind of problem that we're trying to solve here, right? So all of these terms and all of the algorithms that you see in these different academic fields are really kind of solving different aspects of the same problem, okay? So it's a very rich area. Um, and one thing that I'm going to mention is that this area is quite mathematical, okay? So, you know, prepare yourself. This is going to be a little bit of a mathematical, you know, derivation type of chapter. Not so much today, but definitely next week. Um, because all the ideas that we're going to talk about are related to how do I take the 3D world and project it onto a 2D image plane? And then how do 2D correspondences imply things about the 3D world again. So we have to understand how to go back and forth between 2D and 3D, and that um, branch of mathematics is called projective geometry. And unfortunately, there's no real way to, to water it down too much. So I'm going to give you the high-level view with the understanding that there are whole other books written all about, you know, specifically problems in projective geometry. So there's a great book by uh, Hartley and Zisserman called um, that one is called multiple view geometry, right? The second edition is out. And that book is like the Bible, in my opinion, for really understanding all the concepts that I'm only going to talk about at a somewhat high level in this chapter. So if you want to learn more about projective geometry, that's a great book. Um, I don't claim to have written a better description of things than that. OK, so the first thing we have to think about is, um, you know, where do we get these feature tracks? So. Uh, we start with feature tracks. Or let me say, maybe it's better to say feature correspondences mm -hmm. that are built into longer tracks. So we didn't really talk about the, we, we kind of talked about the, the two frame correspondence problem. Find a point in image one, match it up in image two. You can imagine how you would extend that idea to now I see images three, four, five, six, seven. Basically, I kind of push forward my correspondence until my matching is not very good and I decide, okay, I can no longer reliably say that this point in image n is the same one as the point in image n minus one. And so where do these correspondences come from? So here's a picture that, um, kind of illustrates that idea. So the top row is kind of messy because of all the dots on it, but this is kind of what I might get if I had a slowly moving camera, right? So this is the kind of situation that you're usually in in the world of video, where you're taking a camera, you're moving it around a scene, right? Now in this case, you know, since the camera is taking images that are spaced apart by not much more than a fraction of a second, you know, the way that a feature, that the way that a neighborhood of a feature point looks in image one is pretty close to the way the feature point is going to look in the image two, right? It's only moved a 30th of a second. And so in this top row, we can usually get away with using, for example, 
Harris corners and simple, you know, sum of square distances metrics for matching points, right? And that's that's probably really what's going on under the hood of your typical match mover is it's using simple feature points, corners, blobs, and then it's using some simple metric for matching them, right? Now here in this image, I've taken three images that are more widely spaced. Now in this case, something like Harris corners is probably not going to work very well, as we learned, right? Because the viewpoint change introduces, you know, rotations, scale changes, affine changes, even, you know, non-affine changes. And so for this kind of thing, to match points between the two images, we may need to use something that's more like SIFT, right? So for example, if I wanted to match, you know, this point on the front of the building to this point on the front of the building when I've moved the camera substantially, Harris corners are probably not going to do it for me. I would need to use something like a more robust descriptor and, and um, feature detector. But that being said, you know, this kind of problem comes up when you're dealing with um, these kinds of structure for motion problems when you have a whole bunch of images that are not taken by a video camera, but you still want to figure out where were the original cameras. And so we'll talk about it a little bit later, but there's a very cool thing that came out a few years ago um, where basically you could search a database like Flickr for a keyword. Like you say, you know, Trevi Fountain or Statue of Liberty, right? You get literally millions of tourist pictures of these places, right? And then you say, okay, now can I figure out Number one, where were all the tourists standing? And number two, can I make a 3D reconstruction of the thing that the people were looking at from these images, right? In theory, you should be able to, and in fact, people have shown that you can, right? So that's not quite the same as the match moving problem in the sense that there's no smooth camera path between all these images, but the same fundamental ideas apply, okay? So that's kind of where that you're gonna be at in something like this. And the third image is just a picture of like a green screen studio where again, in cases where you can physically introduce features into the world, then, by all means, you should do so, right? So in this case, you know, I went into this green screen studio and I put a bunch of masking tape crosses on the walls and on this object. And then in that case, I know exactly where the object that I care about is, right? And that's something we talked about at the end of the features chapter was that in the real world, visual effects artists will try and go in and they'll try to place some marks or some geometry in the scene for tracking later. And the, and the tracking that they're talking about is for the purposes of later match moving, right? And so, you know, it would, it would be dumb to not do something like that, especially in a green screen environment where you've got this huge featureless background, right? Okay, so I'm not gonna really say too much more about like feature detection because we already knew all about how to do that from a couple chapters ago, right? One thing I will say though, is that now we know some stuff that we didn't know in chapter four, which is that, you know, you should always uh, make sure that your features that you estimate are consistent with the epipolar geometry, for example, right? So we know that when nothing is moved in the scene, that two pictures of the same scene are related by this epipolar geometry that says that correspondences can only lie in certain places, right? So before you do any more match moving, you should really weed out any correspondences that don't match that assumption, right? Those are only going to confuse you, okay? And you should also weed out, you know, correspondences that you're not sure about, you know, it may take a little bit of hand tweaking to say, okay, this is a good track, this is a bad track. You may need to actually also maybe add some tracks yourself by clicking on places that a tracker might not find. Like say you have a, you know, say you've got the center of a table where there's no feature there, but you say, okay, I, I need to have some creature dancing on this table right here. Maybe you'll try and physically put a point kind of by eyeballing it on this table throughout the shot to build a track that is close to where you need it. Another thing to think about is that, you know, as the camera moves, you know, features are going to get pushed off of one side of the image and, and the new image texture that you hadn't seen before is going to appear on the other side. So you should always be searching for new features as the camera moves, right? So as features get pushed off one direction, you should be kind of doing a scan in the newly exposed image for new features and trying to match those, right? So as opposed to a single image pair, the feature matching process is kind of a continuous process of looking for stuff. Um, Finally, you know, one thing to be aware of is something like this situation, which I would call a false corner, right? So here's a picture where, you know, I've got this foreground building and this background building. And according to almost every metric that you might devise, these two features look like a good match, right? If I were to look at the local area between these two features, I would say, hey, nothing that would prevent me from making this a good match. And if I have enough of these features, they might even by mistake kind of pass the epipolar geometry test, or they might, they might throw off my epipolar geometry estimation so that I'm confused about what the actual geometry is. But so the reason this is a false corner is that 
even though in 2D things look great, this is not the same kind of thing in 3D. I mean, it's, it's close to the same on the, on the front surface of the building, but if I were to move that feature over onto the back of the other building, I would be talking about an extremely different point in 3D, right? So all this is just to say that you don't want to just take the features that come out of your detector and descriptor matching algorithm as gospel. You probably want to do some little bit of hand tuning of these features before you go on to the next step. Okay. Okay. So any questions about that? Let me just say also, so my book is really more on the theoretical underpinnings of match moving. There's also this great book by a guy named Dobbert who wrote a book about the practical aspects of match moving. Like if you're going to set up a match move, how should you do it? You know, what features should you try and find? What's the best way to set up your cameras in a way that's going to make the move succeed? So if you really ever want to get down to the nitty gritty of how to set up your own match move shot and you have the freedom to do so, then that's a great book to look at, right? That's really the hands-on professional kind of book. Okay, so the first thing that I need to talk about to talk about any of this stuff is how does a uh, camera form an image, okay? So, so far, all the images that we've talked about in this class, we've just kind of assumed that they come from somewhere. We know they're shot by some camera, but we don't really know the 3D relationship between the world and the image plane, okay? But now I need to make that relationship a lot more explicit, okay? So, um, so let me draw a line here. So let's talk about uh, image formation. Okay, so we kind of know that, if I were to blow this up, so here's my camera, here's the world, and what happens is that there is an opening, you know, right at the end of your lens called the aperture, right? When you click the shutter of the camera, that's what opens, let's lie into the camera, and then what happens is that there is some surface behind the aperture that forms the image, right? So what happens is that, let's see if I can do this, a point in the world gets projected down through the aperture onto you know, what used to be a piece of film and now is basically a CCD array, right? A light sensitive array, okay? But the principle between film cameras and digital cameras is fundamentally geometrically, you know, the same, okay? Now, um, if you think about it, uh, and I think that maybe it's easier to draw it from the side, so this is, this is like, well, okay, suppose this is a tree, okay? <laughs> Ta-da! Very nice, right? So, let's think about what happens to this point here. So this point kind of comes up to here. So if I were to think about what would, what would the image plane be, it would be a tree like this, right? So really the uh, projection process turns the image upside down, right? And flips things left to right. So when you get your film developed and you look at your negatives, huh, if you, any of you have ever done that, uh, you know, it doesn't matter to you because you don't notice the flipping, right? And the same with your, with your digital camera, you know, it automatically tells you the right way up. But in practice, the way that things are physically formed on the image plane is flipped, okay? And so instead of, um, instead of dealing with this flip mathematically, what we often do in computer vision is we make an equivalent assumption that the image plane is actually sitting out here in space in front of the camera, right? If I think about it, then I would get exactly the same image as this, except it would already be, you know, right side up, right? And so I'm gonna assume from now on that actually there's a camera center. So this thing here, we're gonna call the camera center. This thing here, we're gonna call the image plane. This thing out here, I'll usually call the scene or the environment. And this distance between the camera and the image plane, we're gonna call the focal length. Okay. So in the beginning, like, so we know, or I know at least, that uh, cameras, like movie cameras, are much, much more complicated than this. They have these lenses that bend and focus light and so on. And so um, this model that I'm showing you right now is what's called the pinhole projection model. And so you may have heard of pinhole cameras. Like you'll see some, you know, maybe when you were a kid, you did a science fair experiment where you took a, you know, 
I didn't, I didn't even know if you could do this experiment anymore. So it used to be that you could buy like some photosensitive paper, right? You would uh, put, it, put it in the back of a shoebox in a dark room, then you would punk, punch a pinhole in the shoebox, and then you'd let light stream through, and if you do that, you'll see an image forming on the, uh, on the photo paper, right? And people have done this actually at crazy scales. There are these cool art installations where people have done this like with a, a barn, right? They will, you know, have a black barn, they'll put something on the back wall that is photosensitive, and then they'll, you know, drill a little hole in the front of the barn, and then they let light stream through over the course of maybe many hours, and you see this ghostly image forming on the back wall of the barn, right? So this is the, the most simple form of image formation, okay? Now we'll talk a little bit about how things get more complicated, but let me just talk about this for now. Okay. Question? Just no. out of curiosity, I mean, I'm a little confused by the focal length being yeah. drawn this way. When usually the focal length in a camera is the, the distance from the camera, which... Yes, okay, so there's, okay. there is a little bit of confusion about the focal length, and so... You're, you're definitely thinking probably about, like you talk about the, the plane of focus or the, er the area in which the, the image is focused, right? Mm -hmm. And so maybe the way I think about this is that you want to think about the image plane as sitting at the point where the camera is focused, where things are sharp, okay, so all right? Maybe at the tree. Well, not all the way at the tree. You want to think about it as, as physically on the film, right? Uh, yeah, it's a little bit confusing. So, okay. yeah, we'll for, for, we'll we'll, 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 yeah, moving on, but, but for our purposes, the focal length is the physical separation between the point where the light enters the camera and the position of the image plane, right? Um, and it's a little bit confusing to think about when you say an image is in focus, how does that relate to the focal length, right? So th that's a little bit subtle, right? Okay. So maybe we'll come back to that. All right. Okay. Okay, so let me just switch back. This is, I guess, a, a picture of what I just showed you with a nicer font. And so here you can kind of see that if the image plane is behind the camera center, things get flipped around, but we're gonna assume that the image plane is in front of the camera center so that basically things project in the same order onto the image plane. Okay, so there are a couple of, um, so here's another kind of image of what's going on. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about 3D points, which I'm gonna use capital letters for, capital X, Y, Z and every 3D point gets projected down onto a corresponding 2D point on the image plane, little x, little y. So again, capital letters for 3D world, uh, lowercase letters for the 2D world, okay? And so you can see that the way I've set this up is that um, I'm gonna assume that the image plane is, so f first of all, there is something called the camera coordinate system, right? So this camera coordinate system basically is a three-dimensional you know, coordinate system that kind of tells us how do we describe points in the world, right? And so initially, we're just kind of going to assume that this camera coordinate system is centered at the, you know, camera center, right? This is it's called the camera coordinate system, and that the x and y axes of this coordinate system are basically aligned with the image plane, and that the positive z axis is pointing out into the scene. So anything that I can kind of physically see with my camera has a positive z coordinate, okay, and also, one thing to note about this, just as a minor note, is that the uh, coordinate system here, as I've drawn it, is technically not a right-handed coordinate system. It's a left-handed coordinate system. So for those of you that are engineers, you grew up listening to the right-hand rule, you know, you do the thing where you figure out the... Yeah, anyway. So the point is that most of the time we like to have right-handed coordinate systems, but in this case, just for making our life easier with the uh, image plane being in front of the camera, that means that things are left-handed. Not a big deal, it doesn't really affect you guys in any way, but just to mention it. Okay, and so again, F here is the focal length that is the physical distance from the camera center to the image plane. And now you wanna know, okay, so if I tell you capital XYZ, what is the corresponding projection onto the image plane? And we can figure that out pretty easily by thinking about looking at this picture from the side, right? So again, here's the camera center. This gray the line is the image plane. Here is the point out there in 3D space. So this is like kind of like I'm looking at it from the you know, position of somebody standing over here, right? So the x-axis is kind of coming out the board at you. And so I can figure out what should this little y be based on kind of similar triangles, right? So I can say that the 3D point is capital Z away and the image plane is little f away. And so the relationship between capital Z and little f 
is the same as the relationship between capital Y and little y, which is a thing I don't know, right? So I can use similar triangles to kind of say, okay, the relationship is, is that. And so if I go back to what that means, so the kind of uh, pinhole projection equations, what I just found out was that little x is to little f as capital X is to capital Z. And little y is to little f as capital Y is to capital Z. So if I rearrange this, you know, the thing I want to figure out that I don't know is little x and little y. So little x is basically f times this, and little y is f times this. And so you'll notice in my previous slide, I put kind of a little, you know, tilde on here. So why did I do that? Well, the little x, little y that I produce from this are not the same as the pixel values that I get from my actual camera. And the reason for that is that, you know, let's think about it. You know, capital X and capital Z, these are like, you know, in these are all have to be in the same units for this to make sense, right? So these things, if I'm taking a real picture on the scale of you know, meters, say. This thing is on the scale of probably, you know, micrometers, right? And so um, when I do this process, what I get is a little x, little y that is measured in the same units as the focal length, which are probably going to be extremely small. That's telling me, the way I think of it is it's telling me where in 3D space on the minuscule image plane did that 3D point end up, right? If you think about it, my CCD array is like, well, you guys, again, may or may not remember how big a 35 millimeter negative was. So certainly these days, things are no bigger than this, and CCDs are a lot smaller than that. I mean, CCDs are actually very small now, right? Think about how small the CCD must be in your you know, smartphone, right? So this gives us the physical position of that point on your smartphone, but now you want to figure out, okay, what is the actual pixel location that I would get? And so the actual uh, pixel value is something more like this. And so basically, you know, these terms here serve to uh, shift the center or shift the zero zero of the image to a corner, right? So basically, you know, when you look at an image in MATLAB or in OpenCV, you know, the, the zero, 00 or the 1, 1 pixel is in the upper left-hand corner, and then you go all the way to the other lower right-hand corner to get the biggest pixel, right? This projection equation assumes that zero, 00 is in the middle of the image, right? And in kind of photography and image processing, you never really think about zero, 00 being in the middle of the image, you think about being in a corner. So this is to shift it, and this pair of numbers here is to scale um, you know x and y by the physical dimensions of a pixel right and so you know basically this is like saying okay well little x when I did this experiment turned out to be you know three micrometers right and now I look in my camera specifications I found out that one pixel is 1.5 micrometers wide. And so that means that my actual pixel location when I look at that image from the camera is two pixels, right? So basically you have to do this little experiment or you have to do this little conversion to get the numbers that your camera is actually going to tell you when it gives you the image, okay? And so all of this is encapsulated nicely into what we call the uh, camera calibration matrix. which we call K, okay? So this K is equal to, it's a three by three matrix, and it has these entries. And these alphas basically are simply the 
uh, kind of focal length in units of physical pixels. Right, so it's kind of like saying, you know, what is the ratio between the focal length and the width of a pixel in the x and y direction? Okay. So this camera calibration matrix kind of encapsulates everything that we need to know about how the camera forms the images, right? It's got the size of the pixels and it's got the what we call the principal point, x0, y0, which tells us where we want to put the center of the image. Okay. And is that a capital F or a small f? These are small f's. Yeah, this is going to be a little bit confusing as I do this, so make sure you're if you, if you have any questions, clarify. Yes? Um, what's the relationship between this and a standard projection matrix? What do you mean by a standard projection matrix? Uh, so, I guess, I'm just going to put this in, so I'm going to bring it back to OpenGL graphics again a okay. little bit. So they have this matrix you can produce, which yes. will. Ah. Okay, so there are two pieces to a camera, right? One piece is kind of what I would call inherent to the camera. No matter where I put it in the world, the camera has what we call, so th these, this is a good time to say about this, these are basically called the internal parameters. Right? So the internal parameters basically follow the camera around. So let's assume that I can't zoom the camera on the fly. Let's assume it's a fixed focus camera, right? So I buy my camera, a fixed focus lens, and no matter where I place that camera physically in the world, it has these properties for how points in the 3D world are projected down onto its surface, right? But there's the other piece, which is where is the camera in the world, right? Those are called the external parameters. That's the next thing I'm going to talk about. And so when you specify like a camera matrix in OpenGL, you're specifying a matrix that combines these two things. And I'm going to talk about how that works in just a second. But for our purposes, it's kind of important to separate out these two things um, to make it clear that there is some stuff that is fundamental to the operation of the camera and there's some stuff that is kind of independent of the internal parameters just where the camera is in space. So let me show you why this uh, produces the image, right? So again, if I assume that um, if I assume that everything is represented in the camera coordinate system, what I can do is I can say that um, my observed pixel coordinate, so this is going to be a little bit of a new notation, there's this weird tilde, oops, this is some new symbol I made, this is a z, All right? so this means um, proportional to, or a different way of thinking about this is equal up to scale. So what happens if I take my 3D point and I multiply it by this k, right? So I have my k, which is uh, f over dx, f over dy, little x0, little y0, 1. I multiply it by my 3D point, and I get a vector. I get f over dx xc plus x0 zc f over dy yc plus y0 zc zc and this tilde means that this is a three-dimensional vector if i want to get back the a vector that is scaled so that the lowest so the last number is one i divide through by the third element so this number becomes 1, and this guy becomes f over dx xc over zc plus x0, f over dy yc over zc plus y0. I guess I left myself a lot of space here. And this is exactly the projection equation that we talked about initially, right? So the idea is that I take a 3D point in the world in the camera coordinate system, I multiply it by this k matrix, and I get the 2D image point, right? So this tells me everything I need to know about how does the camera act on points in the camera coordinate system to put a point into the image plane, right? Now you're going to see this notation a lot in this chapter where there's some thing that is fundamentally a two-dimensional quantity that I represent as a three-dimensional vector that is kind of proportional to something else, right? Part of the reason for that is that 
projective geometry, unfortunately, involves a lot of this kind of process of dividing one thing by another, right? That's inevitable. Uh, but the uh, way that we write this equation kind of obscures that or a little bit. It makes things much easier to write, right? So I don't have to, I don't have to divide anything. If I just were to show you this, this just tells me that I multiply image coordinates and I get, or I multiply scene coordinates and I get some image coordinates. Um, this kind of notation where I tack a one on the end of something that doesn't necessarily need it, this is called homogeneous coordinates. And you're going to see this in this chapter. Okay. We're also kind of making what's really a nonlinear transformation. Yes. This also makes a nonlinear transformation into a linear one. I mean, it's, it looks linear, but it's not actually linear. Right. Yeah. But that's a good point. Okay. So questions or comments about that? Okay, so the first thing to talk about basically here is, well, what about, you know, we, we know that real world images are not uh, pinhole projection. And, and one, one reason that's true is that um, if you look at real images, right, so if you have a normal lens, a real image looks probably something like the right image, where we have this kind of distortion that comes from the non-ideal lens, right? And so this usually manifests itself as what you call barrel distortion, where this thing is kind of bowed out, right? So instead of the checkerboard looking like a nice rectangle, it looks like its um, you know edges are kind of bulging out. And the same is true even up here if you look at this light, right? We know that this light should be a straight line, but it looks like it's kind of like this curved thing. You're probably used to looking at images like this and not really thinking about it too much, but it is true that basically you know most cameras have some type of lens distortion. Okay. Now to apply all the stuff we need to do next we need to both model and undo this lens distortion because we kind of assume in the following stuff that we're dealing with these ideal cameras, okay? And so, um, let me just say a word about lens distortion. So, lens distortion means that things that should be straight kind of appear to kind of bulge out a little bit. And the model for how this works is something like this. So if I think about what the distorted image coordinates look like, it's usually something along the lines of what you would call radial distortion. It's an it's, it's a un un sorry. The notation here gets a little bit hairy. I'm sorry to say. So basically, what we're saying is that the amount of bowing out that I see depends on how far away the point is from the center, right? And so here, I'm kind of assuming the center of the distortion is the zero zero of the image. And then the idea is that the further away that my point gets from zero, zero, the more you observe this bowing out behavior. Usually the, the middle of the image may not look too distorted, but the outer edges of the image look like they're bowed out. Okay. And so this is called radial distortion. There are other kinds of distortion too. Maybe for example, the center of the bowing out is not the middle of the image, but somewhere else. There's things called that's like called tangential distortion. So there, there are other kinds of distortion, but this is the basic idea. Question. Uh, just to be clear, the, uh, the second and third term, the second third term is squaring the square. Yes, squaring the square. So basically the second term is right. Right. That's not a yeah, yeah. So let me I should explain this better. So this is basically saying that what I have maybe it's easier to think about it this way. So I look at the you know radius of the point. It's kind of like this, right? So it's kind of like saying that the amount of distortion depends on the distance of the point from the center. And I can add terms that are linear in that distance or quadratic in that distance, basically, right? 
Normally, you can probably stop with just a couple of terms. I mean, you can even probably stop with this term if the thing is not too distorted, right? And so, really, to undo the distortion, what you need to do is uh, estimate these uh, lens distortion kind of parameters or coefficients. And the easiest way to do that is to take an image like this, where, for example, here, I know that this checkerboard should be square, right? And so what I can say is, okay, I could assign kind of world coordinates or image coordinates to the true positions on the checkerboard that I know should be in a rectangular grid. And then I observe the distorted uh, checkerboard and I use that to undo the distortion because I see a bunch of examples of you know, correct point and distorted point and it becomes a kind of a linearly squares problem where, again, I only have two numbers I have to measure, which are the, or estimate, which are the K1 and the K2, right? So I've got lots of equations in only two unknowns. So it's not too hard to undo the lens distortion if I know, hey, I'm, I'm looking at something that should have been a checkerboard, right? So you can see a little more details in the, in the book derivation, but that's the idea is that, you know, you know what it should be, you observe what it is, and then you undo it, right? So one of the most common things initially to do when you're shooting a film is that you place a checkerboard in front of the camera at the, you know, lens settings that you're going to use to film the actual shot. You show this checkerboard, and then later on you undo the distortion based on this image of the checkerboard, right? Um, that's, that's a very common thing to do. Okay. So now I want to get to your question about when you look at OpenGL or something like that, you know, what is the camera matrix, right? So there's this other concept called the external parameters. And so basically the issue there is that currently, so far, we kind of assumed that this was my camera, this was my image plane, and here was a point out in the world, right? And I denoted these with little sub C subscripts to indicate that those were points that were in the camera coordinate system, right? But in the real world, we don't necessarily always describe points in, in the camera coordinate system. For one thing, we may not really know that, right? So it's like I like say, okay, well, actually, you know, maybe there's some other coordinate system in the world that in this coordinate system, I would get a different way of describing that 3D point, right? So it's kind of like a change of coordinates, right? So putting it another way, for me standing in front of the room, maybe it would make a lot of sense for me to describe 3D points in this room where I'm the origin, and then this is the Z direction, this is the X direction. And if there's a camera over there, we're gonna disagree on the 3D interpretation of a point unless we have a way of converting between our coordinate systems, right? So basic, that's basically encapsulated by a rigid motion, which means a rotation and a translation of the camera. So this is kind of like the camera coordinate system, and this is what I call the world coordinate system. And um, we kind of convert from the world coordinate system to the camera coordinate system with a rotation and translation. Which is also sometimes called a rigid motion. So it means that if I want to know how should a point be described in the camera coordinate system, I, I rotate the uh, world coordinate system and then I push it over with some translation vector. So this here is a 3 by 3 rotation matrix. So even though it's got nine numbers in it, it's really only defined by three angles, right? You know, you have kind of the pitch, raw, pitch, yaw, and roll, right? So there's basically three angles. And if you actually write down what the rotation matrix is, it's full of cosines and sines of these angles. So, really, so, so it really only depends on three numbers. So basically the whole rotation plus translation involves six numbers, three for the rotation, three for the translation. And this way, I can take any point in the uh, world coordinate system and convert it to the camera coordinate system. Once I've got it in the camera coordinate system, I can push it down onto the image plane. Okay. And so if I put all this together, right, I know that my image point, so this is what we talked about earlier, 
my image point that I actually see is, e is proportional to k times this thing, which I just learned would be the same thing if I applied a rotation to the world coordinate system and added a translation vector. And so a different way of writing this would be k rotation matrix translation vector times the scene point followed by a 1, right? So if I think about how this works, right, this this multiplication, so this becomes a 3 by 4 matrix, right? This guy here. So forget about the k for a second. So that's like saying I multiply this 3 by 3 matrix times this 3 by 1 vector, and I get this, and I multiply the translation vector by 1 to get that, right? So I can see this kind of encapsulates the whole thing. And so I'm going to call this whole <coughs> thing here P. And P is what we call the camera matrix. So it's a little bit confusing because we have a camera calibration matrix, which is K, and we have a camera matrix, which is P. And P is the one that kind of ties everything together, right? So in OpenGL, you're, you're probably specifying P, right? You give a three by four matrix that tells the camera how to interpret points in the world and put them into the image plane, right? So that's probably what you're used to doing, right? And so again, this is a three by four matrix. If you think about it, even though there are 12 entries in this matrix, there aren't actually 12 degrees of freedom in the whole thing because we know that there's only three degrees of freedom for R, three degrees of freedom for T. And then if you look back at the way that we formed up K, you know, there's really only, you know, four degrees of freedom here. The focal length, the principal point. Actually, actually, I guess the way I've written this, there's 11 degrees of freedom. F, DX, DY, X0, Y0, right? But in practice, most, um, you know, most cameras these days produce pixels that are square, right? Meaning that the aspect ratio, which is like the difference, you know, the ratio between dx and dy is just one, right? So it used to be that you dealt with these kind of either weirdly made or poorly made cameras that you could have non-square pixels back in the day. And also even more crazy, you could have non-rectangular pixels. You could have pixels that were actually like little parallelograms due to poor manufacture or misalignment or something like that. So there was something called the skew, which basically told me what the angle of that parallelogram was. These days, for any camera that you would encounter, you can rely on the you know skew being zero and I think the pixels being a square. Okay. And so putting this all together, we often represent this, if I were to kind of represent this with a bold X for image coordinates and a bold capital X for scene coordinates, I can kind of encapsulate the entire image formation process with this really simple equation, right? Everything is inside this camera matrix capital P, okay? And so kind of going forward, what we need to know, so, so now this kind of sets up the problem of match moving, right? So the problem is we don't know capital P for given camera position. So we need to estimate that. So in some sense, what's happening is that at every point of the camera motion, we need to estimate the corresponding P matrix, okay? And we will, and so fundamentally what's changing as the camera moves is that the rotation and the translation, the external parameters are changing. If we assume the camera is not kind of continuously zooming, then the K matrix is fixed and that fixed K matrix will help us with our analysis later on, okay? Okay, so questions about the setup? Yes? Yes, in this case, the world coordinate is also left-handed, right? So we're going to assume that, are... yeah, all the coordinates are left-handed, that's right. And because we want this rotation matrix to be a normal rotation matrix that has determinant one, right? right. We could do it the other way with a rotation matrix that had determinant negative one, but we don't want to do it. Right. Okay, so what I want to talk about for the rest of the time is what I would call single camera calibration. Okay, so how could I find this P? Okay, so there are two things I want to talk about. One is actually pretty simple, which is called resectioning. 
And this is a fancy word for saying estimating P from known little x and big X, right? So it kind of stands to reason that if I knew a bunch of 3D points, and I also knew exactly where those points were on the image plane, then I have lots of information that I can use to estimate the camera matrix, right? So if I look at the, again, if I look at the, um, the P matrix like this, Right, so every correspondence basically gives me um, three equations in 12 unknowns, right? So in theory, I don't really need to, well actually that's not exactly true because uh, one of these equations is redundant. So it actually kind of gives me uh, two equations in 12 unknowns. So two independent equations. In 12 unknowns. Again, kind of similar, I have to keep on remembering to do this, kind of similar to the fundamental matrix, the camera matrix is only defined up to scale, right? So if I were to multiply the whole camera matrix by 12, this equation would still be true because this tilde is going to remove any scaling of the camera matrix. So fundamentally, I know from the get-go that there are only 11 degrees of freedom that I have to estimate, and there are some further degrees of freedom that can be removed from things like knowing that the pixels are square and stuff like that, okay? But if you were to write this out, right, what you would fundamentally get, I'm not going to do this in any detail, but you could say, okay, well, xi is uh, fundamentally equal to um, p11 xi plus p12 yi, dot, dot, dot. So you can kind of see where these linear equations are going to come from. So the idea is that if I were to set up um, a bunch of correspondences where I knew these are the 3D coordinates, these are the corresponding 2D coordinates, I can estimate my P, right? So I can kind of say, okay, you know, I can turn these into a vector, a 12 by one vector P. This whole thing turns into a linear system like this. And this is like a 2N by 12 matrix where N is the number of correspondences I have. And then I can go through and do something that's similar to how we estimated the fundamental matrix or how we estimated a projective transformation to come up with those values for P, okay? So it's not hard to do, okay? I mean, the thing that is hard to do is that in the real world, you rarely know the 3D coordinates of things that you care about, right? One, one way that you could get those 3D coordinates is, for example, by taking a laser range finder, right? And saying, okay, I'm gonna point this laser range finder at a bunch of points in the world that I have surveyed. And actually, that's a lot like what the guys who are uh, on the side of the road with the, with the device are doing, right? Is they're triangulating 3D points with their kind of uh, bore-sided you know, image thing to figure out how do I assign 3D point you know, locations to stuff in the world, right? So if you have an accurate survey of the environment, such a survey could, for, for example, might come from like a LiDAR scan. We're gonna talk about that in chapter eight. You know, those 3D points, you can get them, you know, if you spend a lot of time to measure stuff, right? So this is not like a totally infeasible thing to do. Um, so at the end of the story, what I get is P, right? And I know that this P is actually made up of, you know, the camera calibration matrix K, the rotation and the translation. And so usually what I want to do is I want to not just get the camera matrix, but sometimes I also want to pull out what is the corresponding K, R, and T, right? So, um, you know, getting K, R, and T from P is just kind of like a linear algebra problem. And I'm, I think I'm going to assign this for the next homework. Fundamentally, you know, if you think about it, this P looks like, you know, um, a three by three matrix here and a uh, three by one vector here, right? And so I can see that my three by three matrix looks like KR, where this is upper triangular, and this is a rotation matrix, also known as an orthogonal matrix. And so there's a linear algebra result that says that there's only one way that I can take any given matrix and decompose it into the product of these two kinds of matrices. 
This is called the uh, QR decomposition, or if you ever did Graham Schmidt in uh, IEA or some linear algebra class, right? So this is kind of like related to the QR decomposition or Graham Schmidt. Right, so once you do this process, you can estimate K and R, and then this thing is equal to KT, but at this point I know K, so I can do the inverse of K to get back T. So that's gonna be a homework problem, but MATLAB knows how to do this factorization for you, right? So this is not a hard thing to do. Okay, so a more common thing to do, which, um, you yeah, know, so, so this is all well and good, but it requires you to actually know 3D positions of things in the world, right? And that's not something that you typically know how to do. So the other way of doing things is what I would call uh, plane-based calibration. And so the way this works is that I'm going to estimate the so this is usually for um, internal parameters is the, is the usual reason why you want to do this, although you also get some external parameters along with it. So the idea is the following, and this is something that actually Matt has a lot of experience with because he did this for your URP project uh, last year, right? So we were in the position of having to calibrate a bunch of cameras, and so the easiest way to calibrate a bunch of cameras is to show the cameras pictures of a checkerboard. Okay, so the idea is, you know, show the camera multiple pictures of a planar surface, you know, and the most common thing to do is a checkerboard. So what I mean by that is like literally something like this, right? So here, what I've done is put a picture of a checkerboard on a computer monitor. I know the computer monitor is nice and flat, you know. You could also just print out a checkerboard and tape it to a flat surface, as long as you know that flat surface is not gonna bend around, right? And then what you do is you show the camera this checkerboard from a bunch of different positions, okay? And here what you're seeing is uh, basically, actually, so one thing that's kind of important to think about is that you know, if I have a camera and I show it a bunch of checkerboards at different physical positions, so this is like a fixed camera and moving checkerboard, that's really fundamentally equivalent to the images that I would take if I were to keep the checkerboard fixed and move the camera around, right? I'm gonna see the same images either way. And so really, it's just a matter of perspective about whether you think about the checkerboard being fixed in space or the camera being fixed in space, right? So for example, in this picture, clearly I moved the camera around physically because I, my monitor is not moving around on my desk. If I wanted to, I could have put the camera on a tripod and picked up my monitor and moved it around, but I probably still would have seen the same checkerboard locations, right? It doesn't really matter from the perspective of understanding the image formation process of the camera, but just to say that, you know, sometimes you need to kind of keep that straight in your head, okay? So what do I see here? Well, what I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna show you some mathematical derivation in just a second, is that what I've done is I have made correspondences between the corners of the checkerboard squares, right? And so that's not hard to do. Like basically, if you were to take Harris corners, for example, and just run them over an image that looked like this, Harris corners are gonna be, it's gonna be like a champ at finding these nice, strong corner locations, right? And then the only thing you have to do is make sure that you match them up the right way. But if you've got these strong grid locations, it's not hard to say, okay, you know, this is the, upper left-hand corner of the checkerboard, and I just kind of start counting along to figure out which checkers match to which other checkers, okay? Okay, so let's do a little math. Okay, so let's assume for our purposes that the plane is fixed at z equals zero, okay? So this is my choice, right? So I'm gonna assume that the plane is fixed, the camera's moving around it, and since I have the total freedom to choose my 
you know, world coordinates, because it's like an arbitrary plane, I'm just going to say that the plane is at z equals zero. So that means that any point on the plane has coordinates capital X, capital Y, z equals zero, and then I can write the, you know, uh, homogeneous part as this. And so now, for any given position of the camera, I could say, okay, I've got my k, my r, and my t, and for any given point on that plane, this is the image point that I get. Again, this is up to scale. And so if I write this out a little bit better, that's like saying, okay, let's suppose I actually look at the columns of this. This is like R1, R2, R3, T. So these here are the columns of R. And actually, you know, if I think about this, when I write it in this way, you can see that this column of R, R3, is always just getting multiplied by the zero, right? And so actually I can write this more simply as R1, R2, T times X, Y, 1. Or putting it a different way, I could say this is just like some three by three matrix H times X, Y, 1. And so what have I learned, right? What I learned is that I have a homography or projective transformation between the 3D point on the plane in the world and the 2D projection of the image, or the 2D projection of that point on the image plane. And this kind of makes sense because one thing I told you way back when is that projective transformations are what relate two images of the same plane. And so what I have here is basically two images of the plane, one is the plane in the world and one is the image plane, right? So those two planes are related to each other, to each other by this H, okay? And so the idea is that, um, so for every camera position, we have a projective transformation or just a three by three matrix H sub I where H sub I is equal to K times the rotation matrix at that point times the translation vector. And here what I'm assuming is that I've got the same camera, right? So the focal length of the camera isn't changing. All the internal parameters of the camera are the same, right? The only thing that's changing is physically, where did I put this camera in the world, right? And so now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use these H's to build my corresponding P, okay? So let me write this um, a little bit differently. This is like saying, Again, this is up to scale, so let me make this a little bit clearer. So let's say that hi is equal so, to some unknown scale factor times, uh, oh, and actually this is not quite right. This is like k r one i. All right, let me <laughs> scratch that. All right, so hi is equal to some scale factor that I don't know, rotation vectors and this translation times this k. I still managed to screw it up. I'm going to write that one more time the right way. Sorry to all the viewers at home. Like this, okay? So this is fixed. These things are changing, right? Or another way to say this is that I can take the uh, inverse of this. I'm going to move the, the k over. So another way of saying this is that the rotation matrices like this are equal to, um, this doesn't really matter, uh, k inverse times whatever these columns of h are. And so here is the trick. The trick is saying, okay, well, what can I do now, 
Well, one thing that I know is that these guys here are rotation matrices columns, right? And the special thing I know about rotation matrices is that, number one, that the uh, norm of each of these guys should be equal to one, right? So that's like saying that this is a unit vector, this is a unit vector. And I know that if I were to take the inner product of these things, I should get zero, right? Because I know the vectors are perpendicular to each other. And now I have some constraints that I can apply, right? I can say, okay, I basically have uh, two, um, you know, I have two constraints or two equations. One says that, you know, R1i transpose R1i equals R2i transpose R2i. And the other one is that R1i transpose R2i equals zero. Now, if I follow that along, that implies some stuff that involves the h's that I know and the k that I don't know. So, for example, let's think about what this first thing implies. So, for example, the first equation implies that um, H1I transpose K K transpose inverse. So I'm, I'm skipping a couple of steps here that are in the book. So and I realize this is a little bit tedious, so it's this is the stuff that's kind of hard to lecture about because it's a little bit like just grungy math. And the second equation, if I work it out, tells me that H1I transpose KK transpose inverse H2I equals zero. Okay. So the thing to get from this, the main concept to get from this is that now I have some constraints. You know, I know this stuff. You know, I don't know this, but I do know some stuff about this, right? So for example, you know, if I think about what does this matrix look like? Well, this matrix is still going to, uh, you know, have a form that looks like this. K, you know, K transpose, inverse, right? I can write out this thing in terms of a three by three matrix that involves all these parameters kind of combined together, okay? For the moment, we could just call this matrix, you know, omega. And this omega basically has five non-zero entries. Again, I realize I'm kind of hand-waving here, but the book has all the details. And so the idea here is to say that, you know, each equation like this puts one constraint on the five unknown entries of this, right? So basically I get two equations in the five unknown of omega. And then I basically can solve for omega. And then I can back out entries of k. So in the interest of time, I'm going to refer you to the book to kind of understand what mathematically that process looks like. But fundamentally, this process is not that, not that bad. And luckily for you, you never have to do it yourself because there is this great MATLAB camera calibration toolbox that I believe is also inside uh, OpenCV. So this, this is the toolbox that everyone uses, right? So fundamentally, it's very easy. You put the, you put the checkerboard images, you take a bunch of checkerboard images, you import them into the toolbox. The toolbox will try its best to extract the corners of the grid after you give a couple of mouse clicks in one of the images. So it will basically build a little 3D coordinate system and it will find the corresponding corner points. It finds them in all the images. Then it 
does the camera calibration process I just described, more or less, and then it comes back at you with the camera calibration parameters. And so now you can see it estimates the focal length for the cameras, estimates the X0, Y0 for the cameras. The skew means that the pixels are square and um, you know not parallelograms. It estimates some lens distortion coefficients if you need them, and that tells you how big the error was between the places where it thought the pixel thought the corners should be and where they actually are. And so it'll make a plot that tells you, you know, how much error did you generate, right? Here, this is like in terms of deviation between what the camera model says the 2D projection should be and what you clicked on in the image. Here you can see, for example, that you know most of the cameras, this is color coded by camera, most of the cameras have very low error, but this pink camera had really crappy error. And so that means maybe I have to go back to my pink camera and make sure that those points are really right on the corners of the uh, image. After I do that, I can maybe achieve a distribution where again, now the error is much lower for all the cameras and this is a good situation. And then what you can do is view the result as this is the you know hypothesis that the camera is fixed. I'm looking at this 3D plane from lots of different angles. And so here's the estimated bunch of 3D angles of the plane that you got. Or you could reinterpret this as a fixed plane in space and these were where all the <coughs> cameras were, right? So, you know, the great thing for you is that you don't have to worry about coding all this stuff up. This is a great toolbox that everybody uses, right? Um, and in fact, so Matt can tell you the story of we had to calibrate a bunch of cameras over an MPAC, except the crisp was that the cameras were hanging from the 30 meter or 30 foot high ceiling. And so basically Matt mounted a you had a checkerboard on a on a binder or something, right? Yeah, it was a British service and you just suspended it from strings. On right. So yes, you had strings and you were like a marionette and he was screwing around with this thing. And so then we used these images of the checkerboard to undistort the, so we had to undo the lens distortion, and then we also, actually bringing it back to the last chapter, there was also then overlap between the cameras, and so then you had some feature points that you placed on the floor to make basically a big mosaic of the floor, right? And so actually, uh, I didn't, I, if I had the foresight, I would have put some slides together, but I, maybe it'd be next time I can show the result of undoing the lens distortion for the impact thing, if I still have it, or I have it with the guys have been doing lately. Yeah. So, yes, so it's kind of a fun thing that we actually do this in practice on a regular basis. This is not like some theory kind of algorithm. We have to do it. Okay. So any questions about this process? Um, you know, again, you can calibrate cameras yourself very easily. Um, and uh, I invite you to do so. Now what I'm going to do is uh, go back to my guy, turn this off.